Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. I now want you to visualize that you're on your deathbed and surrounding you on your deathbed are the ghosts of the unfulfilled potential. They're the ghosts of the dreams that you never acted on. And they're angry, they're disappointed, they're frustrated. And they say to you, we came to you because you could have brought us to life. But now we must go to the grave together. So I ask you all today, how many ghosts are going to be surrounding your deathbed when your time comes? And it's a lovely full circle moment where it just gets them thinking about their life. Yeah, wow. I was, <laughs> for that first half until you went about the deathbed part, I was like, I'm on the right track. Brilliant. I'm doing it. I'm doing all of that. I'm on the right track. I, I, I'm doing it. And then you came up with that. I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> I need to think about that side of things. Yeah. You got me thinking. I'm going to I'm going to look at that. I'm going to think about. Thanks for that, Rob, because that wasn't part of the plan. So, we're no, very <laughs> honored to have that part of the podcast and that's going to be powerful. That's going to be really really powerful. Yeah, you're right. I I, I what well, I can it's parallel to that. I, I think I've always and again, I've not been perfect. I've not been perfect in my in my life. I've got definitely got shit wrong, don't get me wrong, but I've always tried to always visualize my funeral and gone, what can somebody say about me at my funeral? You know what yeah. I mean? I, I heard mm -hmm. that, God, years ago, and it's kind of stuck with me, and I thought, yeah, that's how I want to think. But I, I, I think that's probably more an external thing, isn't it? What you've just gone on is more of an internal thing to f live the fulfilled life and stop worrying about yeah. what people might say about you. And so I was probably yeah. wrong in thinking that. Well, I wasn't wrong, but it, I'm just re-angling yeah. it now. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that more in, more in depth. Okay. Back to you, though. Um, there was one more question I, I was pondering earlier. What do you do in terms of a to set yourself up for the day? Is there a, do you have a particular routine? Do you do meditation? Do you do cold exposure? Is there something that sets you up for the day? To be honest with you, I I've done these things before, and you know I was doing especially in the shower. I was like at the end of the shower, I get a little bit of cold exposure, mm. and I stopped doing it recently. I just started getting out of the habit and I need, I need to get back into the habit because it's very good but in terms of setting me up for the day it's it is all about to be honest with you the sleep that I get the night before mm. now I'm not I will never be this person who says that you need to go to bed at this time of the night every single night and get a routine and get up every time although the sleep experts will be hating me for saying that because they say you know you have to have that routine but I'm just not that kind of person where I just, I go with the flow. I go to bed when I feel exhausted. I, I go to bed when I feel tired and I wake up, you know, within a, a time frame between this time and this time. And that's it. And, you know, sometimes I'm going to be a little bit more tired. Yes. But whenever I am now living this life of full of passion, I get up with a spring in my step. Now, don't get me wrong, some days are a little bit harder because I want to sleep a little bit longer, but I wake up with passion and that takes away every one of these habits, the, the meditations and the cold exposure. For me, that takes away the need for them all because I can't wait to start the day. I can't wait to go to work and be like, right, what's in store today? Mm. So, although, don't get me wrong, the meditations, the yogas, the uh, cold exposure, all brilliant things. But I think my point here is that it's all about what is unique to you. If you love waking up in the morning, you love grabbing a coffee first thing in the morning and reading a book or just taking time just to look out the window. If that works for you, then brilliant. And I think in life, we overcomplicate well-being a little bit where... People think, oh, I've not, I've not done this. I've not done this. This is what they're saying. This is the cool things to be doing nowadays. I always think, what works for you? Do, mm. If you need to take time for yourself in the morning, brilliant. If you want to just crack on with work, brilliant. Whatever works for you, you follow. And for me, yeah, like I said, all these things are incredible. I've got great benefits. But for me, that living a aligned life gets me out of bed. And it puts a smile on my face right from the get-go. So that's, I think that's so important. 
Yeah, great piece of advice and great perspective as well, isn't it? Um, you know, and, and a lot of that, what you've just said, it falls into, I think, your core value of having that freedom, doesn't it? Mm. Um, not everybody does live, I suppose, that freedom life. Um, yeah. If I go to bed, if I choose to go to bed at one o'clock, I still have to be at school by 9 a.m. So, yeah. <laughs> do you know what yeah. I mean? Exactly. So, the cold shower definitely wakes me up. Not that I do that every, I do, well, I did, I do do the cold shower every morning, but I genuinely enjoy it and I, I love the, the, yeah. the benefits that it gives me. But you're right. I think, I think, I think I would, the, some of the, the scientists that I live to, and even like Stephen Bartlett from Diary of the Seal, he talks yeah. about how he has no alarm and he yeah. chooses to get up when his body tells him to get up. And and I think I think that would be the perfect way to be. Um, if I if yeah. I, if I could have a bit more of a choice or a little bit more freedom in my life, I I think I probably would do that as well. Uh, my my kids might say otherwise, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll, that's when when they're older, I suppose I can let that one go. They'll be staying in bed till two p.m. Yeah. No <laughs> doubt. So uh, <laughs> I think you know I think when we when we did discuss last time, I think a good one a good one liner to put this. Uh, I was thinking this is a. Uh, I think you said it last time, and put this as a title for this episode. I think it's probably perfect. It was trauma to purpose, yes, right? That's it. Yeah, that's it. I think exactly. that was beautiful. Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's so true. And we'll obviously go through the 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 story for the trauma side of it, but the purpose side of it, I I've, I've definitely found my purpose in my life. And when you find your purpose, you know it. You know it deep down when you find your purpose. It's like this idea of happiness and unhappiness. For me, sometimes it's very hard to know what makes us happy in our lives but we tend to know what makes us unhappy and we can remove the unhappiness in our lives and then we can get left with the things that make us happy in our lives. Because sometimes, let's face it, it's hard to be like, this makes me happy. We don't know what makes that. We have to try different hats on to be like, oh, actually, you know what? That wasn't for me. Although I thought it was, that's not for me. We need to try different hats on. So that's why it's so important to actually understand what makes you unhappy because then you remove it and you'll never go down that road again. You can just start focusing on the new things and be like, right, these are the things that I think will bring me happiness. And guess what? If they don't work, they don't work. Because we've all thought that something was going to bring us joy or happiness and it's not worked. And you can't beat yourself up because at least you're not living that unhappy life. So, yeah, it's very important just to cut out the unhappiness to find your purpose. Yeah. I mean, yeah happiness the more I've delved into, you know, survival emotions and, and, and all of those uh, different mindsets, I, I look at happiness as being, um, I suppose, you know, in schools, they talk about happiness as an, as an emotion. Well, for me, that's not one of the eight, nine survival emotions. Happiness is long term. So that would be serotonin. And then pleasure would be dopamine short term. Right. So for me, what makes up happiness, the long term effect, like I, I'm happy in life now. But if you were to yeah. say something horrible to me now, of course, I'd be sad or enter yeah. anger. But it doesn't mean I'm unhappy that the no, state exactly. of happiness above me hasn't gone. I'm just yeah. I'm just sad or angry in the moment of somebody speaking to me poorly or hurting yes. me. I fell off my bike. I'm sad. I'm, I'm, I'm in pain. I hurt my ankle the other day at basketball. I could not walk for a day. Yeah. And I was sad. And, and, and frustrated, but I'm still happy in life. The state of happiness didn't go away. So for me, that's threefold is one, under, understanding my, my, my life purpose, two, satisfaction. So when something I am enjoying is finished, well, I've jumped ahead there. So purpose, um, enjoyment and satisfaction. I'm enjoying yeah. the things that I do and then I'm satisfied when they're finished and I just look forward to it the next time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Somebody definitely. who doesn't know the purpose or isn't happy, they might love something and then when it's finished, it they they can't handle that it's finished. It's because they don't have yeah. that overarching happiness in their life. De definitely. And I say this so many times where you can be an unhappy person. You're going to live an unhappy life, but happy, but have happy moments. You can have yeah. joyful moments. And the same goes for happiness. You can be happy, but you're going to have sad moments. You're going to have down moments. You're going to have these negative emotions creep in. But yeah. you've hit it, the nail on the head there where it's, it's about what's the overarching thing. And... I think we need to get clear where there's sometimes that toxic positivity that comes into happiness and think, I have to be happy all the time. No, 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 no. no, no. You can have your down days. Sometimes yeah. I just think, you know what, today is a write-off because I'm just so down or angry or frustrated at something. And, you know, we just wake up literally on the other side of the bed and you just, you just feel like you're in a bad mood. That doesn't mean I'm not happy. It's just I'm, I'm having a day of negative emotions and that's fine. Mm -hmm. 
So that's where toxic positivity really does creep in in society and it's it's a concern because it's just not right we we cannot be happy all the time that's just a fact of life yeah i know in the schools here i don't know what they do in the uk or, or spain or wherever united states for that matter you know we th- th- if someone's sitting in the red zone and they're angry it, why is it in a red zone yeah. We, we just we, we're putting down anger as a really negative emotion okay it's undesired but it's yeah. a survival emotion that we once needed in the in the in the you know hunter gatherer times. We yeah. we needed that. Uh, and guess what? When you're sixty, you're going to be angry. When yeah. you're sixty, you're going to be sad. When you're mm-hmm. sixty, you're going to go through the the emotion of fear and disgust and shame. But guess what? It's about how we handle those emotions. How do yeah. we come out of those emotions in a healthy way? Right. Yeah. That's so it. yeah, I struggle with saying to children you're in the red zone no you're not in the red zone you sit there then for as long as you need um and we'll we'll pull you we'll pull you we'll pull you through it because you know if you go to people i mean children in particular but even adults you, your prefrontal cortex is offline when you're angry so okay. going to them with logic is not going to work no. you need to go to the limbic <laughs> system you need to hit them with emotion sit there hold space be quiet just let them know that you're there that's all that yeah. you mean. Then when the prefrontal cortex comes back online, you can start to talk to them with logic and, yeah. and, and come with some form of strategy, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. do you feel the same or? Oh, 100%. I think like when the, that saying of when we see red, we just we literally just, our emotions go and we just, we lose kind of sight of what we would usually say, what we would usually how would we usually deal with something when we get angry? Yeah, it's we are offline. Things reason doesn't come into it, so yeah. it really is important to hold space for. And yeah, anger is an emotion that we all will have and should have. It's yeah. not, you know we have the negative emotion to anger, but also you know anger can be such a great tool because once you know as long as we're not acting out with anger. But if we're sitting in anger, it can actually motivate us to do something. I've been angry in certain situations, but then after that initial anger went through, it's, it's actually prompted me to take action on something. Because mm-hmm. I've been angry at something of how something's turned out or a current situation. And then I'm able to change it and be like, well, you know what? I'm angry about this, but this anger is my fuel to motivation. I'm going to get this. You know what? I've got the bit between my teeth and I'm ready to go. So anger is actually good. It's like stress. We talk about stress and we we put so many negative things on stress. Stress is good. But when stress is chronic and excessive and we don't have a good relationship, then stress is bad. Completely get it. But I think some people, yet again, it's this toxicity that exists with positivity and things like that. Stress, they think, oh, we can't, you know, we need to try to focus on how not to be stressed in our lives. If you think that you'll never be stressed in your life, then you, you won't live a life. Yeah. You will be stressed. Of course you will be. And stress is good. Yet again, it gives you that motivation to be like, you know what? I'm stressed, but I'm motivated to get this done. But it's just about having the balance, making sure that it's not, doesn't tip. Anger is the same. These negative emotions that we say are negative, it's all about having the balance. And that's life. Happiness is exactly the same. We can't be happy every minute of the day. We have the balance. It's the the analogy of the heart rate. The heart rate has ups and downs throughout, but it's the heart rate of going up and down which actually makes us human. It makes us alive because if that was flatlining, if our emotions are flatlining and we're just the same all the time, we wouldn't be living a life. So Agreed. good way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Agreed. So with that in mind, you didn't get to all of this mindset and understanding the brain and the emotional sides by doing what you do. You got here somehow. So let's go to the beginning. Um, Talk about your little, you you talk about your childhood. You, you moved from uh, Belfast to Scotland, didn't you? How old were you when that happened? Uh, So I moved at 18, 19, I think it was. So I, I moved for university. So it was... When I was a, technically a man, <laughs> uh, I moved Sorry, to yeah, university. I forgot, I, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, I had a, a good childhood in Belfast. But it was um, it was a childhood which was 
uh, there was a shadow of the troubles in Northern Ireland, which was a lot of violence that existed during my parents' probably time and there uh, when they were growing up. It was always there. That's the thing, you know. It stopped officially in 1998 when they signed an agreement, and I was born in 1992. Now the violence wasn't as prominent as it was in my family's time, but it had knock-on effects. And for me, it had knocks on knock-on effects because my parents were probably very sheltered with me. They didn't want to take risks, which is fair enough because of what they've seen that was happening in Northern Ireland. So they were they were very sheltered, and it. Yeah, we didn't have the, me and my brother, we didn't necessarily have the freedom to spread our wings in Northern Ireland because maybe some of those concerns. But we had a we had a good childhood. We had a loving childhood. And yeah, a childhood I look back on fondly, so which is always beneficial. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. And so you went to the University of, um, you were in Dundee, weren't you? Yes, yeah, University of Dundee, yeah. Yeah, nice. And what did you study there? I studied history, so oh. I I loved history. I still do love history. It was never because I wanted to become a history teacher or a professor or an archaeologist, anything like that. I just loved history. And I think this is where my childhood's probably been brought into, where I just wanted to spread my wings and experience something different, where I had a little bit more freedom. And, yeah, it was an opportunity to, to go to a different country. I know it was still in the UK, but different country and yeah, just do something I loved. So and I did. I, lo I loved that. I loved studying history and I still do. So it was definitely a, an aligned decision at the time. Was there a plan when you went to study that at university in mind for the future? No, no if I'm oh. honest with you. I, I wanted to join the Royal Navy when I was 18 years old and I tried to join um, as an officer. So I had, to, I wanted to go in straight away as a warfare officer. And I passed all the, all the, all the exams and things like that until my last ever interview. And in my last ever interview, they obviously had seen something in me that was maybe that immaturity or, or something. And they said, look, we think that you should either go in as a normal seaman or go away, get some life experience about you and come back to join as an officer. And I look back, you know, obviously I was disappointed, but I look back and think they were so right because I had a sheltered upbringing and I was 18 years old and I hadn't really experienced life. So to go in straight as an officer was probably a tall order. And mm. so I had the choice to make and maybe it was ego led, but I didn't want to join as a normal seaman because I had visualized joining as an officer. So I was like, this is what I wanted. So I put that to the side and I thought, well, I'll go to university then. And that's where I was like, well, what do I want to study? I want to study something I'm passionate about. So history came on. So the idea initially was I'd probably go back and go in as an officer to the Royal Navy. That didn't necessarily transcend because I was, I, I worked, I didn't work, but I was part of the officer training corps within university. And a few things happened there where I just was like, hmm, this is too rigid. This is too regimental. This is not who I am. I know it's the army, but you know, army, navy, it's still the military. And I just didn't enjoy it. So it kind of put me off the notion of the navy. And I then just went through the last couple of years, not knowing what I was going to do. So I had no clue what I wanted to do or where I'd end up. And that definitely was in the back of my head. That concern, that worry was definitely in the back of my head when I did then make a decision of what I wanted to do next. Mm. What was it that you wanted? What, well, what was it? Then? Well, the, the, what came up was yeah. that the, the police force in Scotland were recruiting and they'd closed the recruiting for a wee, a wee while before then. And my brother messaged me and said, by the way, I'm going to join. I'm going to put my application in. I'm not sure if you'd be fancying it. And I was in my last year of university and I thought, hmm, by the time I go through all the process, I'd probably be done the process when I'm done university. So I, this, this could, this could work. And it wasn't the same military regimented concept of the military that I was like, okay, maybe I could see this. Mm. My family were either military or 
please. So yet again, this idea of success was already in my head where I'm like, okay, military police, okay, I can see this. And one thing led to another, I put an application in, I thought, where's the harm in putting an application in? One thing led to another, and three months later, I was I was at the college with my brother and I quit university in fourth year because the opportunity came up earlier. And there fourth I was. Year. Yeah, so I was wow. in the middle of doing my dissertation. I was doing my <gasps> dissertation about football and World War One and the impact that the war had on, on football in the UK. Yeah. And it's yet again something I was passionate about, but I saw this opportunity and just, it's yet again, just probably the fear of, yeah, but what happens at the end of university? I didn't know what I wanted to do and I've got this opportunity and they said, there you go, you're going to get paid this and here's the offer. And as 22-year-old, getting seeing this kind of opportunity of a career and seeing an actual paycheck, which mm. seemed good. I was like, okay, well, I'll just do this. So, and because I didn't, because I didn't go to university for that degree, I thought, why not? Why not just leave? I got the life experience I needed and I'd be in a career like this for the rest of my life, which didn't transcend that way. <laughs> Did you ever regret not finishing the degree and getting the degree or is that still not oh, really on your mind? Not, no, if I'm honest with you, no. I got a, what do you call it? Just, you know, the, the degree you get after three years, come remember what you call it. I got that with distinction. So oh, I, yeah. I was, yeah. I, I was, I was happy with what, you know, and I said, there's a yeah. little bit of me that would have maybe wanted to finish the dissertation just because I loved research and I loved studying. But no, I, I had no regrets. I have no regrets with leaving and not finishing. Yeah, well, that's good. Uh, so not long after the police, I think this is kind of where our stories align and yeah. kind of run uh, parallel to one another. Um, this is where I really connect with you. Not really long into the police, things started to kind of go wrong. Yeah, and I put that all down to culture. The culture mm -hmm. was one of toxicity. It was so toxic where you have an environment, you had a culture where people didn't look after their mental health. You had a culture where the employer didn't look after the well-being of their staff. And you had a culture where this macho-ness existed. The idea of what a man was. Now, I'm not saying they literally said, by the way, a man can't cry, a man can't show their emotions. But it was through their actions, their behaviours, where you thought, hold on, this is a boys club. And at least in my experience, and I was, I was always a sensitive soul. I was always somebody who wore my emotions on my sleeve before joining the police. So joining the police, I started to get hardened. A, because you had to get, get to a level of hardness with what you were seeing. But B, the other side of it was because I was seeing what people were like around me. And they were so hardened to their emotions that nothing would phase them, or at least on the surface anyway. So I was then saying, well, this is what I should be like. And I was the easy target. I was the youngest one in my team by a lot. I had just left uni. I didn't have the life experiences. And I felt like people could could smell the, the fear, so to speak, on me. And they jumped on it. And I, I'm somebody who will happily laugh at myself. I will make myself but the joke to make other people happy, no problem. But I always know that there's a line because if I'm making myself the butt of the joke, as long as I'm laughing with you, it's okay. If people are making me a butt of the joke repeatedly and all of a sudden I'm no longer laughing with you and I'm just getting laughed at, that is the problem. And that's what started to become like where I felt like I was getting laughed at. I was getting sidelined, judged for certain things. And I just was not, it just, I just didn't feel at home. I didn't feel safe and I didn't feel comfortable. And it takes its toll on you. That bullying takes its toll on you. And that, there's no other word for it, but bullying, psychological bullying, not physical, but psychological bullying. And it was very hard for me to go through that because I'd never been bullied in, in my life. And there I was, young, compared to everybody else. And I felt out of my death. And I was looking around me, seeing all these people making me the butt of their jokes. And 
having banter, which I can accept banter, but as I said, banter then goes too far. And the banter just then became rude. It became personal. And the problem is these people will, if you said to them, if you brought them into a room with me, not one of them will ever say that they intentionally bullied me, I don't think. But whether there is intention or not, their intention was to make me to butt their jokes. They were wanting to have a laugh at my expense. So that ever people thought they were funny, but I'm there sitting because I was the easy target. And then, yes, some of the times, you know, they would even say to me that I should get back to my own country. You know, I'm from Northern Ireland, still part of the UK. And I was in Scotland and getting told by my colleagues. Like, I was, I jailed people for racial abuses, for calling me things about Ireland and stuff like that. I jailed people for racial breaches. And then my colleagues would say, you're stealing our jobs. Uh, our, our Scottish people's jobs get back to your own country and initially it was a bit of banter and one time I rem- I saw that it wasn't banter when I I I laughed at one of them I you know made them the butt of the joke but that was the first time doing it and it was just funny it was the, the I read the room where I was like no oh, this will be you know funny not in his expense but mm-hmm. laughing with him because he was that kind of individual and he didn't like it, which is fair enough. We can all maybe not like a joke, but he didn't, it wasn't that he didn't like the joke. He didn't like that people were laughing at um, with him. Well, it should have been with him, but I think he turned it a different way. And he turned to me, he says, well, what do you know? You shouldn't even be in this country. You should get back to your own country. And I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. That nastiness in that split second shows your true colors. That shows you what you truly think of me and my position here. And I was like, I thought to myself, wait a minute, this was literally just a joke because we were all joking. And I thought, that was not a joke. You see, you weren't adding on to the joke. You've made that personal. And that is just, for me, I just thought, I just felt so isolated in this job. What physiological responses did you go through? What did you lose within yourself? What, what affected your mind and your body and your soul? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.